What's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the Renewable Energy Smart Pod. I'm your host, Sean McMahon, and today we're going to be talking all about batteries. Now, when most people think of batteries these days, they probably think of lithium ion batteries. But lots of questions are starting to be asked about lithium ion batteries questions about safety, sustainability, and the supply of the rare earth materials that go into those batteries. Plus, in a world that seems full of geopolitical instability, business leaders and policymakers are facing tough challenges related to securing the supply chains that deliver all those materials that are needed to make lithium ion batteries. So with all those battery questions swirling, I'm excited to be joined in a few minutes by Hugh McDermott from ESS. The team at ESS has pioneered a different kind of battery, iron flow batteries. Hugh is going to share some of the basics about iron flow battery technology. We're going to talk safety, sustainability, and performance. And Hugh will explain how batteries from ESS are already, yes, already, playing a role in the long-duration energy storage market. But before Hugh and I start our conversation, here's a quick word from the sponsor of today's episode, ABS Quality Evaluations. Get serious about sustainability. Assurance services from ABS Quality Evaluations can guide you with ISO certifications for environmental, health and safety, energy management, and more. Our globally accredited experts can help you become energy efficient and save overhead costs. Go to www.abs-qe.com or click on the link in the show notes to learn more. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for today's show. I'm pleased to be joined by Hugh McDermott. Hugh is the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Sales at ESS. Hugh, how are you doing today? Awesome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. I want to hear about some of the latest in battery storage technology. And uh, ESS, you guys are all about iron flow. So why don't you give our listeners, some of them know a lot about the battery space, some of them might not. So what are the basics of iron flow batteries? Sure. So for your listeners, a a flow battery is a different kind of battery where the electrolyte that's commonly part of an electrochemical battery is kind of like the circulatory system of a body. In our case, the blood is iron saturated in salt water. And so as it's circulating through our batteries, what's physically happening during the charge cycle is iron is coming out of the solution and it's collecting in a layer on the carbon plates, uh, the cathode. And so as we build up that layer, that constitutes energy storage. And then when it comes time to discharge that battery, when we want to put energy back into the grid or to feed a customer's operating plant and so forth, we just reverse the polarity. We're not reversing the flow or the pumps or anything like that. We just reverse the polarity and the iron dissolves back into the solution. And that's the the basics without getting too technical about it. It's got a lot of unique attributes. Uh, Being water-based battery, obviously it's not flammable. It's not going to blow up. Being salt water and iron, can't think of uh, anything that could be any safer for people or the planet in terms of a battery that that we're going to see lots and lots more of in society um, around the world. You mean these batteries aren't going to explode? Is that what you're trying to say? (laughs) (laughs) Well, not only that, but anybody can work on them, right? You don't need uh, specialized expertise. You don't need to wear what we euphemistically call the bunny suits to be able to handle it. It's just standard basic industrial maintenance. It's nothing exotic about it. All right. Now, most people are familiar with lithium ion batteries. So how do these batteries that your team is is working with, how do they compare when it comes to cost versus lithium ion or performance or even sustainability? How do the two compare and contrast? Sure. Well, lithium ion batteries are great at where you need high power in small formats. And they were good for the grid um, in the past number of years when renewable energy penetration was kind of in the single digit, low single digit realms. You could put a half hour battery or a one hour battery, which is inherently where lithium ion technology kind of takes you out to about two hours. Can you stretch them and make them into a four hour battery? Of course you can. You can just double up the batteries and you can double them again and make them an eight hour battery. But the cost and economics of that start to tail off pretty dramatically as compared to our battery. Ours is a long duration battery. And we define long duration as being more than four hours and less than 24 hours. Of course, there's even longer duration batteries, which could go out for even days. But we play in that daily cycling space, if you will, in in the battery spectrum. In that 8 to sort of 12-hour sweet spot, which is where the industry has 
shifted in, in the last two years and where it's concentrated now in terms of long duration storage, we feel we have a compelling economic advantage over lithium ion in, in two regards. One, we're at or below the capital cost of those lithium ion batteries in that range today. We also have the advantage of our batteries are designed to last for decades. You know, the design life on a products that we're shipping today is 25 years. A typical lithium ion battery has a three to five, three to seven year life and it gets replaced. And so when you see these projects that people announce coming out for 10, 15, 20 year lithium ion batteries, of course, they're making them last that long, but they're in the yard every month to replace the batteries and the modules that are worn out and fatigued and so forth. So we don't have that type of issue. So we have we have an advantage in terms of that O&M, we believe, as well. So bottom line, when you're measuring in the utility space or you're a large energy user, you want the lowest cost per unit of energy coming through your energy storage. And we believe we have a substantial advantage over lithium ion battery in that category. So is that what you think makes this a game changer? The low maintenance, you know, long lasting life of these batteries? For sure. A uh, game changer, not only in terms of lower cost, but if you think about sustainability, you think about supply chain risk, the geopolitical risk around rare earth minerals, those aspects, we have a great story to tell because we have more than 90% of our vendors that supply our products are US based. And when we look at sort of secondary sourcing, we're well above, we're probably the, the most domestic sourced uh, battery manufacturer available in the US today. So you don't have any of those risks as well. So we don't have the price volatility and commodity risk associated with some of the other chemistries like lithium, uh, like vanadium. So we can give customers uh, more certainty around what the price is going to look like in the future, and they can make their decisions in a more, in a higher confidence approach. Yeah, it seems like, especially now with all the supply chain and like you said, rare earth materials being such high demand and, you know, even worries that they'll be impossible to get at any price, really, it seems like it's right. kind of peace of mind to be able to plug one of these in and not have to worry about it for 20 years, right? For sure. And and I know we're going to talk about at some point the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and we have a compelling advantage in that regard as well because of that domestic content. Okay. Yeah. I definitely want to get to the IRA in a little bit, but I just have a couple of questions for you first. So you mentioned how these batteries are a smart play in the, in the long duration energy storage field. How does it stack up against other solutions that are you know kind of being hyped these days? I mean, I've done a couple of episodes about green hydrogen and things like that. You know, Where do you see those from a competitive landscape? Green hydrogen is an interesting one because most of the hydrogen technologies out there, the one, you know, what we know about them is that the, the technologies don't like to be start and stop. They like to be base loaded to sort of hit the economics. And so being able to operate one of those around the clock with clean energy is an important part of how you get a clean energy, a, a green hydrogen output that's economic. You need to do that. You need a long duration battery and a battery that can go for many years, if not decades, to make it economic. So green hydrogen is actually a, a segment that we think is very complementary to uh, our technology. In fact, we help, we believe, enable green hydrogen to a large degree because of the duration of our batteries and the longevity of our assets. So we don't see it as a necessarily as a direct competition uh, to what we're doing. We see it as a, a, a fellow traveler and a, a potentially very interesting segment for us to go serve. Okay, that's interesting. So in getting back to like users for these products, right? Which commercial industries are the best fit for these kind of batteries that ESS is producing? It's probably easier to say uh, which ones, uh, and, and I'm, I'm struggling to think, you know, who would not be a good fit for this kind of technology? So any customer that where energy, energy costs are a, a factor in their overall business that, that drives some of the cost of their product, or secondly, where energy resiliency is important to them. You, know, you could think data centers, you can think hospitals, you could think uh, refining operations, petrochemical, you know, energy resiliency is everything to those types of customers. You could extend that into the utility world very readily where keeping the lights on, keeping the grid energized, resiliency. You know, we, had, we saw like Texas freeze two years ago. We see wildfires and once in a century events seemingly happening every other week in the news. And you know, so if you're in the business of where energy is important to you, how you operate and resiliency, a long duration battery like ours, one that you can cycle without concern over degradation is part of that equation. 
Yeah, I feel you on that. It definitely seems like we've had more than our fair share of the uh, once in a hundred year storms <laughs> and things like that. You know, it's funny. Hardly a week seems to go by where we don't read some new record setting storm. You know, yesterday I was reading about two hurricanes in the Atlantic this late in the season. And it's been, I don't know that it was record setting, but it was definitely abnormal. And this morning's uh, climate news are talking about Arctic uh, wildfires becoming a thing that could upend uh, the decarbonization efforts um, with climate change. So all of these are putting you know, climate change, these weather events, they put huge stress on the grid, on an already aging grid. Um, so it really puts a premium on resiliency for energy supply and the society that we live in today. Yeah. So speaking of resiliency, and you mentioned the, the freeze in Texas. So so if I'm a hospital, if I'm running a hospital down in Dallas somewhere, and I got to worry about having you know backup power generation for the next of many hundred year storms, as we've been saying, what does that look like? I mean, how many of these batteries do, am I going to call ESS and say I need? Because you, know, you said there is a certain hour limit on it, but those folks are out of power for, for multiple days. How do they stack them? Sure. Well, Every customer's needs are going to be unique to them themselves. Uh, we basically have taken an approach to kind of standardize the product. We have product we're shipping today uh, is primarily targeting the commercial and industrial community. Microgrids can be used by utilities. There's no limits on who could use it, but it's it's sized and designed primarily to be a drop-in place, plug-in, add water battery. And so depending on your needs, uh, you can add one, two, ten of these type of batteries, depending on what your project requirements would be. Now, when we talk about large utility scale, we've taken the exact same technology. We're repackaging it in a different format that gives us even more capability. So think about a tractor trailer sized container. That's the basic building block, if you will, for the first one I spoke of. In the second case, we're going really large. We We stack those and we can... We can get more than a megawatt hour in a in the footprint of a single container. And so that's really the building block for how you go big with this technology, depending on what the project requirements are. We'll be right back. It's time to get serious about sustainability. Assurance services from ABS Quality Evaluations provide your customers and stakeholders confidence in the high standards of your operations. With over 30 years of experience, we can guide your sustainability journey with key ISO certifications for environmental, health and safety, energy management, responsible care, and more. Our globally accredited quality and risk experts can assist you in reducing your carbon footprint, becoming energy efficient, and saving overhead costs. Go to www.abs-qe.com or Click on the link in today's show notes to get started today. And now back to our conversation. And so you mentioned earlier, yeah, I want to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. So what kind of impact do you think the IRA will have on the wider battery market? I mean, we're hearing a lot about tax incentives and things like that. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's the single most uh, defining event of this century, perhaps, for the U.S. energy sector, to not uh, understate it. The provisions in that act start with, in terms of where we fit in the energy spectrum, there's a domestic content. So one of the intents of the act was to try to drive domestic investment in energy technologies, uh, particularly around batteries for EVs and batteries for the grid. And so batteries that meet the domestic content, which is the 40% domestic content threshold, can qualify for a 40% investment tax credit. And so almost right out of the box, the cost of our technology, for example, because we, we meet that domestic content threshold is almost half off straight away. So anyone who was looking at long duration storage, considering our technology and had maybe a marginal business case prior to the IRA is now suddenly uh, knocking on our door. It gets even better depending on the site and the type of customer. That ITC, if you were a nonprofit, such as a municipal utility or a co-op utility, SMUD, the partner that we just announced a a partnership with uh, Sacramento Municipal Utility District uh, a few weeks back is one of those types of players. That ITC gets to be converted as a cash check back to SMUD when they put that unit into service. So if you had a $100 million project and you had a 40% ITC, 
the day after it went into service, you get a, you submit and you get a $40 million check back from Uncle Sam under the IRA. Profoundly changes the game for that category of customers. And then ITC is also available to private sector companies, just has a different way of being monetized. But then it, if you have projects that are cited, for example, in uh, where power plants were closed down, coal fired in particular, uh, it, since 2009, and more recently, coal mines that may have been closed down as we shift away from coal-fired generation, locating those as part of an economic development driver can boost those those ITC incentives to above 50, all the way as much as 70 percent, depending on the circumstances. So you can imagine, you know, the massive amount of investment that's required, and now you're looking at a 40 to 70 percent discount on that. So it's a complete game changer for this industry. And uh, the smarter folks are already lining up. It's starting to have the look and feel of a gold rush kind of landscape out there in the energy storage realm. Yeah. And I know ESS is one of the few players that's actually up and running in, in mass production and things like that. I guess I'll ask you a tongue in cheek question. Is is the IRA like a problem? You're going to have too much business and too, too much too much of a good thing, if you will? It's not a problem in that sense. It, it's our number one challenge. And it was our challenge before the IRA came along was scale. The demand was always there. This just sort of turbocharged that demand. And so for us, and, and I think I, this would be for all of your listeners, uh, the, the game has changed in the sense that the demand is so great that there's going to be this massive imbalance between the demand and what's available for the next several years, at least through the end of this decade is our estimation doesn't matter what technology you're looking at, lithium ion, any of the newcomers, et cetera. And so really what customers are starting to figure out is that this is a global arms race. And that's not just here in the U.S. If you look at what's going on in Europe, you've got the Ukraine war, which in January, nobody saw coming happen. Suddenly it's upended the entire calculus of your energy security situation for all of Europe. And so what were previously 2050 decarbonization plans and goals, they're accelerated in some cases all the way to 2030. And so you've got that competing demand for renewable energy and energy storage, U.S. IRA uh, investment that's going to be massively flowing into the sector. And then you've got places like Australia that are hugely uh, accelerating their plans with shutting down of coal. So it's, it's happening around the world. So that the supply demand imbalance is going to be there. And it's like a strategic arms race in a sense. And so for us, it's not a bad problem to have, obviously, but it bodes for, uh, I, I'll say the symbiosis that we're seeking is to work with partners who realize that's going to be there for some time and want to place ever larger orders, get in line now, and gives us the visibility and ability to plan our capital investment for manufacturing expansion. We're going as fast as we can regardless, but we can go a lot more confidently. We can talk to our financiers with a lot more surety when we have long-term supply agreements in place. And so that's kind of the big change that's fundamentally happened at a commercial level, if you will, since IRA. Yeah, it sounds like it. I was, I was just having some fun with you there. It sounds like it's a good problem to have, you know, too many customers queuing up to to get your product. One quick question on emergency response type stuff. And how long does it take for one of these batteries once you drop it in place to come online? And I ask that from a perspective of like, you know, a hurricane wipes out a power structure or something like that. Like these things are about the size of a shipping container. I mean, can you just drop those in and, you know, what's the time frame look like? Yeah, they're not really particularly well suited for that type of mobile application. If I understand your question, Sean, they'd be more of a case where you'd have it already pre-installed, already plugged into the grid. And let's say you wanted, you anticipate or you foresee through weather forecasts that there could be an issue and you want to plan for it. And so I'll take one of our customers right now in Southern California. Uh, They've installed a microgrid for several megawatt hours. And the primary motivation for doing this was to keep the lights on when the grid goes down. They're prone to these wildfire risks during hot, dry, windy conditions uh, they'll shut off the lines to avoid the risk of sparking a potential wildfire in the backcountry in, in Southern California. When that happens, the communities that are at the end of that line can go for hours, days. It's even gone for a couple of weeks in some instances. And so you can imagine how disruptive that would be to uh, everyone from families to businesses. The microgrid here uh, is that insurance policy where it's solar plus our batteries. 
They chose our batteries for two reasons. One as the fact that it's not going to be a, a potential cause of a fire. It's not a lithium ion battery. And second, if a fire were ever to reach that for any reason, it's not going to blow up in a fire because it's just water and salt and iron. Uh, so that was kind of a, a fundamental attribute. But the fact that the battery can cycle without degradation for years and years means that the whole rest of the year, they can be providing sales of energy into the grid, earning some revenue on that. They can be providing services to give better quality power to uh, the end of the line out there, if you will, providing frequency response and, and voltage support and so forth. All knowing that I'm not compromising my primary reason why I he- I'm here in the first place, which is to be there when the grid goes down. And so that's something you can't do with a lithium ion battery uh, very readily because Every time you cycle that battery, you're taking a little bit off of its life. And every uh, decision you make today is going to affect the decision of how you use that battery tomorrow because of the constraints inherent within the technology. We don't have any of those constraints. And so the resiliency aspect, you know, could you be there for the, the next hurricane? Could you be there? People are actually in this business and trying to support reliability are actually designing projects around that that, that get multiple use cases out of that. And that's how our batteries sort of differentiate from a lithium ion battery in particular. Okay. Now you mentioned that customer in Southern California, and we also talked about Sacramento earlier. So, you know, I was digging into some research. You guys have, you know, announced some big deals also in Australia. So, so what can you share with us, you know, the details of those projects and, and how these batteries are being put to use in real world scenarios? Sure. Well, Sacramento, uh, the most recent one is a partnership with Sacramento Municipal Utility District. And they had laid out their plan for achieving zero carbon business by 2030. They identified in their plan some gaps. Uh, They identified some risks. We reviewed their plan. We had a discussion with SMUD about how we thought we could help de-risk their plan. We could help fill some of those gaps. And they were concerned not only about addressing those aspects, but also what's this industry? Is the industry going to be able to serve their needs in terms of a supply side because of this demand that's uh, building in the industry. And so the partnership was basically premised on giving them some certainty of supply. Up to 200 megawatts was the minimum we would guarantee of our manufacturing over the next several years. Second, giving them some visibility to the pricing and confirming we'd give pricing out to those years without being subjected to commodity variables and variable pricing. And then third, what got a little bit less attention is Given what's happening in this industry, it's going to be a it's a people short industry today. It's going to be even more so in the future. Uh, we have a workforce development and capacity building element to this partnership. So we're going to be working with local universities and the local uh, business community to develop the vocational skills, the technical workforce to support not only Sacramento, but we think will become a center of excellence for ESS and, and the battery community in general, for certainly all of California and possibly the West. And so it's really, those were the aspects of the Sacramento that really got us excited. In Queensland, it's a little bit different. Uh, The market there in in, uh, Australia, it's a long ways away from here. Economics suggests why would we ship steel to our plant to assemble it and then ship steel all the way to Queensland? Maybe that's not the right way to go. So the partnership there is with with a local entity that's going to be setting up assembly of our products in Queensland. And so we will be building the battery modules in our Wilsonville facility in Oregon. We'll be shipping the battery modules and some other uh, bits and bobs, as they say, uh, down there. And they will do the assembly of the of the whole product to support the Australia, New Zealand market. And so it's an assembly and they've pre-purchased a considerable volume of our components that we're going to have to be supplying down there. It's a very large market for us. We're couldn't be more excited about what's going on in Australia. That's incredible. This is this is great. I really appreciate you kind of you know, educating me and our listeners about what's going on in the long duration energy storage battery market. Before we get out of here, I do want to ask you, I mean, you, you guys are headquartered here in Oregon. That's where I'm at. Recently, Energy Secretary Granholm came through uh, with not one, but both of Oregon senators in tow and the governor. And there was quite a delegation that paid a visit to your headquarters. What was that like? Seems like you got a lot of VIPs all at once. Uh, no, it, it, it was great to get the recognition. We are super appreciative of uh, U.S. Department of Energy. It gets kind of lost in the the annals of our, our storytelling, but DOE rightfully could be considered a co-developer of our technology. Very early on, they helped sponsor 
a lot of our initial research and R&D. They helped sponsor some of the prototype development. They helped sponsor some of our early pilots. So I'd like to give a shout out to DOE whenever I have the opportunity to. And, and of course, Senator Wyden, uh, I think this, we sort of represent a lot of what he's worked for for more than a decade as a thought leader in energy policy. So for us, it was super exciting. They, they got a tour through the plant. The whole plant was excited. Uh, we're still a little bit on a high after that. That's great. It's great to hear yet another good story coming out of some of the yeah. energy department's you know, support. So, well, hey, Hugh, thank you very much again. I appreciate your time. This has been wonderful. Hope you have a great day. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you for your listeners. That's our show for today. But before we get out of here, I want to say one final thank you to our sponsor, ABS Quality Evaluations. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends and colleagues. And be sure to follow us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at RenewablesPod. And if you'd like a daily dose of renewable news delivered to your inbox, head to SmartBrief.com and sign up for the Renewable Energy Smart Brief. The Renewable Energy Smart Pod is a production of SmartBrief, a future company.